Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at line six of the Bagua Linear 64 Palms and break it apart. We are also going to do some work with hip rolling into Dragon Stir's Earth and High Gooey. And anything else going on the docket? And Wall Sit, which is always fun. Um, I've started doing some online live classes. They'll be posting on Saturdays and Wednesdays. You can go to flyingtortoise.org slash schedule, schedule to see all of that good stuff. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, comments, uh, requests, let me know. I'll try to incorporate. Take care, everyone. I'll go down back in Bubble DC. Martinez and Johansson floated down the hall door docking for A. Hips. So, he said, who would you have eaten first? She glared at him. Plus, I think I'd be tastiest, he continued, flexing his arm. Look at that. Good, solid muscle there. You're not funny. I'm free range, you know. Corn fed. She shook her head and accelerated down the hall. Come on, I thought you liked Mexican. Not listening, she called back. Chapter Change four. sides. Log entry. Soul 376. I'm finally done with the rover modifications. The tricky part was figuring out how to maintain life support. Everything else was just work. A lot of work. I haven't been good at keeping the log up to date, so here's a recap. First, I had to finish drilling holes with the Pathfinder murdering drill. Then I chiseled out a billion little Why chunks stance? between the holes. Okay, it was 759, but it felt like a billion. Then I had one big hole in the trailer. I filed down the edges to keep them from being too sharp. Remember the pop tents? I cut the bottom out of one, and the remaining canvas was the right size and shape. I used seal strips to attach it to the inside of the trailer. After pressurizing and sealing up leaks as I found them, I had a nice big balloon bulging out of the trailer. The pressurized area is easily big enough to fit the oxygenator and atmospheric regulator. One hitch. I need to put the AREC outside. The imaginatively named atmospheric regulator external component is how the regulator freeze separates air. Why sink a bunch of energy into freezing stuff when you have incredibly cold temperatures right outside? The regulator pumps air to the AREC to let Mars freeze it. It does this along a tube that runs through a valve in the Habs wall. The return air comes back through another tube just like it. Getting the tubing through the balloon canvas wasn't too hard. I have several spare valve patches. Basically, they're 10 by 10 centimeter patches of hab canvas with a valve in the middle. Why do I have these? Consider what would happen on a normal mission if the regulator valve broke. They'd have to scrub the whole mission. Easier to send spares. The AREC is fairly small. I made a shelf for it just under the solar panel shelves. Now everything's ready for when I eventually move the regulator and AREC over. There's still a lot to do. I'm not in any hurry. And taking it slow. Widen that stance. One four hour EVA per day spent on work, the rest of the time to relax in the hand. Plus, I'll take a day off every now and then, especially if my back hurts. I can't afford to injure myself now. I'll try to be better about this log. Now that I might actually get rescued, people will probably read it. I'll be more diligent and log every day. Log entry. Soul 380. This Remember my experiments with the RTG and having a hot bath? Same principle, but I came up with an improvement. Submerge the RTG. No heat will be wasted that way. I started with a large rigid sample container, or plastic box, for people who don't work at NASA. I ran right. the tube through the open top Circles. and down the inside wall. The swoop. Then I coiled it in the bottom to make a spiral. I glued it in place like that and sealed the end. Using my smallest drill bit, I put dozens of little holes in the coil. The idea is for the freezing return air from the regulator to pass through the water as a bunch of little bubbles. The increased surface area will get the heat into the air better. Then I got a medium flexible sample container, Ziploc bag, and tried to seal the RTG in it. But the RTG has an irregular shape, and I couldn't get all the air out of the bag. I can't allow any air in there. Instead of heat going to the water, some would get stored in the air, which could superheat and melt the bag. I tried a bunch of times, but there was always an air pump direction. to get out. I was getting pretty frustrated until I remembered I have an airlock. Suiting up, I went to airlock 2 and depressed.
pressurized to a full vacuum. I popped the RTG in the bag and closed it. Perfect vacuum seal. Next came some testing. I put the bagged RTG at the bottom of the container and filled it with water. It holds 20 liters, and the RTG quickly heated it. It was gaining a degree per minute. I let it go until it was a good 40 degrees Celsius. Then I hooked up the regulator's return airline to my contraption and watched the results. It worked great. The air bubbled through just like I'd hoped. Even better, the bubbles agitated the water. Right, right here, the external heat. rotation. I let it run for an hour and the halves started to get cold. The RTG's heat can't keep up with the total loss from the halves' impressive surface area. Not a problem. I've already established it's plenty to keep the rover warm. Grab the feet, draw the belly, raise the head back. And things got back to normal. Log entry. Sol 381. I've been thinking about laws on Mars. Yeah, I know it's a stupid thing to think about, but I have a lot of free time. There's an international treaty saying no country can lay claim to anything that's not on Earth. And by another treaty, if you're not in any country's territory, maritime law applies. So Mars is international waters. NASA is an American non-military organization, and it owns the HAB. So while I'm in the HAB, American law applies. As soon as I step outside, I'm in international waters. Left then when leg. I get in the rover, I'm back to American law. Here's the cool part. I will eventually go to Schiaparelli and commandeer the Ares 4 lander. Nobody explicitly gave me permission to do this, and they can't until I'm aboard Ares 4 and operating the comm system. After I board Ares 4, before talking to NASA, I will take control of a craft in international waters without permission. That makes me a pirate. A space pirate. Log entry. Zone 383. You may be wondering what else I do with my free time. I spend a lot of it sitting around on my lazy ass watching TV, but so do you, so don't judge. Also, I plan my trip. Pathfinder was a cake run. Flat, level ground all the way. The only problem was navigating. But the trip to Schiaparelli will mean going through massive elevation changes. I have a rough satellite map of the whole planet. It doesn't have much detail, but I'm lucky to have it at all. NASA didn't expect me to wander 3,200 kilometers from the half. Acidalia Phoenicia, where I am, has a relatively low elevation. So does Schiaparelli. But between them, it goes up and down by 10 kilometers. There's going to be a lot of dangerous driving. Things will be smooth while I'm in Acidalia, but that's only the first 650 kilometers. After that comes the crater-riddled terrain of Arabia Terra. I do have one thing going for me, and I swear it's a gift from God. <clears throat> for some geological reason, there's a valley called North Vallis that's perfectly placed. Millions of years ago, it was a river. Now it's a valley that juts into the brutal terrain of Arabia, almost directly towards Schiaparelli. It's much gentler terrain than the rest of Arabia Terra, and the far end looks right like hit. a smooth ascent. Internal rotation. Between Acidalia and North Vallis, I'll get 1,350 kilometers of relatively easy terrain. The other 1,850 kilometers, well, that won't be so nice. Especially when I have to descend into Schiaparelli itself. Ugh. Anyway, North Vallis. Awesome. Log entry. Sol 385. The worst part of the Pathfinder trip was being trapped in the rover. I had to live in a cramped environment that was full of junk and reeked of body odor. Same as my college days. Rim shot! Seriously, though, it sucked. It was 22 souls of abject misery. I plan to leave for Schiaparelli 100 souls before my rescue, or death. And I swear to God I'll rip my own face off if I have to live in the rover for that long. I need a place to stay where I can stand up and take a few steps without hitting things. And no, being inside in a goddamn EVA suit doesn't count. I need personal space, not 50 kilograms of clothing. So today I started making a tent. Somewhere I can relax while the batteries recharge. Somewhere I can lie down comfortably while sleeping. I recently sacrificed one of my two pop tents to be the trailer balloon, but the other is in perfect shape. Even better, 
has an attachment for the rover's airlock. Before I made it a potato farm, its original purpose was to be a lifeboat for the rover. I could attach the pop tent to either vehicle's airlock. I'm going with the rover instead of the trailer. The rover has the computer and controls. If I need to know the status of anything like life support or how well the battery is charging, I'll need access. This way I'll be able to walk right in. No EVA. Also, while traveling, I'll keep the tent folded up in the rover. In an emergency, I can get to it fast. All right, figure eight. This is the basis of my bedroom, but not the whole thing. The tent's not very big, not much more space than the rover, but it has the airlock attachment, so it's a great place to start. My plan is to double the floor area and double the height. That'll give me a nice big space to relax in. For the floor, I'll use the original flooring material from the two pop tents. If I didn't, my bedroom would become a big hamster ball because hat canvas is flexible. Fill it with pressure, it wants to become a sphere. That's not a useful shape. To combat this, the hab and pop tents have special flooring material. It unfolds as a bunch of little segments that won't open beyond 180 degrees, so it remains flat. The pop tent base is a hexagon. I have another base left over from what is now the trainer balloon. When I'm done, the bedroom will be two adjacent hexes with walls around them and a crude ceiling. It's going to take a lot of glue to make this happen. Log entry. So All right. Hi, Dewey. Opposite body movement. The pop tent is 1.2 meters tall. It's not made for comfort. It's made for astronauts to cower in while their crewmates rescue them. I want two meters. I want to be able to stand. I don't think that's too much to ask. On paper, it's not hard to do. I just need to cut canvas pieces to the right shapes, seal them together, then seal them to the existing canvas and flooring. But that's a lot of canvas. I started this mission with six square meters, and I've used up most of that, mostly on sealing the breach from when the hab blew up. Goddamn airlock one. Anyway, my bedroom will take 30 square meters of the stuff. Way the hell more than I have left. Fortunately, I have an alternate supply of hab canvas. The hab. Problem is, follow me closely here, the science is pretty complicated. If I cut a hole in the hab, the air won't stay inside anymore. I'll have to depressurize the hab, cut chunks out, and Changing put it back directions. together, smaller. I spent today figuring out the exact sizes and shapes of canvas I'll need. I need to not fuck this up, so I triple checked everything. I even made a model out of paper. The hab is a dome. If I take canvas from near the floor, I can pull the remaining canvas down and reseal it. The hab will become a lopsided dome, but that shouldn't matter, as long as it holds pressure. I only need it to last another 62 salts. I drew the shapes on the wall with a sharpie, then I spent a long time re-measuring them and making sure, over and over, that they were right. That was all I did today. Might not seem like much, but the math and design work took all day. Now it's time for dinner. I've been eating potatoes for weeks. Theoretically, with my three-quarter ration plan, I should still be eating food packs. But three-quarter ration is hard to maintain, so now I'm eating potatoes. I have enough Next to last up. till launch, so I won't starve. But I'm pretty damn sick of potatoes. Also, they have a lot of fiber, so let's just say it's good I'm the only guy on this planet. I saved five meal packs for special occasions. I wrote their names on each one. I get to eat departure the day I leave for Schiaparelli. I'll eat halfway when I reach the 1600 kilometer mark and arrival when I get there. The fourth one is survive something that should have killed me because some fucking thing will happen. I just know it. I don't know what it'll be, but it'll happen. The rover will break down. No I'll come down with fatal hemorrhoids or I'll run into hostile Martians or some shit. When I do, if I live, I get to eat that meal pack. The fifth one is reserved for the day I launch. It's labeled Last Meal. Maybe that's not such a good name. Fog Entry. Soul 388. I started the day with a potato. I washed it down with some Martian coffee. That's my name for hot water with a caffeine pill dissolved in it. I ran out of real coffee months ago. My first order of business was a careful inventory of the hat. I needed to root out anything that would have a problem with losing atmospheric pressure. Of course, everything in the hat had a crack. 
crash course and depressurization a few months back, but this time would be controlled, and I might as well do it right. The main thing is the water. I lost 300 liters to sublimation when the hat blew up. This time, that won't happen. I drained the water reclaimer and sealed all the tanks. The rest was just collecting knickknacks and dumping them in airlock 3. Anything I could think of that doesn't do well in a near vacuum. All the pens, vitamin bottles, probably not necessary, but I'm not taking chances. Medical supplies, etc. Then I did a controlled shutdown of the hat. The critical components are designed to survive a vacuum. Have deep press is one of the many scenarios NASA accounted for. One system at a time, I cleanly shut them all down, ending with the main computer itself. I suited up and depressurized the hat. Last time, the canvas collapsed and made a mess of everything. That's not supposed to happen. No, the dome of the hab is mostly supported by air pressure, but there are flexible reinforcing poles across the inside to hold up the canvas. That's how the hab was assembled in the first place. I watched as the canvas gently settled onto the poles. To confirm the depressurization, I opened both doors of airlock 2. I left airlock 3 alone. It maintained pressure for its cargo of random crap. Then, I cut shit up. I'm not a materials engineer. My design for the bedroom isn't elegant. It's just a 6 meter perimeter and a ceiling. No, it won't have right angles and corners. Pressure vessels don't like those. It'll balloon out to a more round shape. Anyway, it means I only needed to cut two big-ass strips of canvas, one for the walls and one for the ceiling. After mangling the hab, I pulled the remaining canvas down to the flooring and resealed it. Ever set up a camping tent from the inside while wearing a suit of armor? It was a pain in the ass. I repressurized to one twentieth of an atmosphere to see if it could hold pressure. Ah, of course it couldn't. Leaks galore. Time to find them. On Earth, tiny particles get attached to water or wear down to nothing. On Mars, they just hang around. The top layer of sand is like talcum powder. I went outside with a bag and scraped along the surface. I got some normal sand, but plenty of powder, too. I had to have maintained the 120th atmosphere, bag filling as air leaked out. Then I popped the bag to get the smallest particles to float around. They were quickly drawn to where the leaks were. As I found each leak, I spot sealed it with resin. Right, next up. It took hours, but I finally got a good seal. I tell you, the hab looks pretty ghetto now. One whole side of it is lower than the rest. I'll have to hunch down when I'm over there. I pressurized to a full atmosphere and waited an hour. No leaks. It's been a long, physically taxing day. I'm totally exhausted, but I can't sleep. Every sound scares the shit out of me. Is that the hat popping? No? Okay. What was that? Oh, nothing? Okay. It's a terrible thing to have my life depend on my half-assed handiwork. Time to get a sleeping pill from the medical supplies. Log entry. Soul 389. What the hell is in those sleeping pills? It's the middle of the day. After two cups of Martian coffee, I woke up a little. I won't be taking another one of those pills. It's not like I have to go to work in the morning. Anyway, as you can tell from how not dead I am, the hab stayed sealed overnight. The seal is solid. Ugly as hell, but solid. Today's task was the bedroom. Assembling the bedroom was way easier than resealing the hab. Because this time I didn't have to wear an EVA suit. I made the whole thing inside the hat. Why not? It's just canvas. I can roll it up and take it out of an airlock when I'm done. First, I did some surgery on the remaining pop tent. I needed to keep the rover airlock connector and surrounding canvas. The rest of the canvas had to go. Why hack off most of the canvas only to replace it with more canvas? Seems. NASA is good at making things. I am not. The dangerous part of this structure won't be the canvas, it'll be the seams, and I get less total seam length by not trying to use the existing pop tent canvas. After hacking away most of the remaining tents, I seal stripped the two pop tent floors together. Then I sealed the new canvas pieces into place. It was so much easier without the EVA. What? Six? So 64? Then I had to test it. Again, I did it in the half. 
I brought an EVA suit into the tent with me and closed the mini airlock door. Then I fired up the EVA suit, leaving the helmet off. I told it to bump the pressure up to 1.2 atmospheres. It took a little while to bring it up to par, and I had to disable some alarms on the suit. Once hey, again. I'm pretty sure the helmet's not on. We depleted most of the N2 tank, but was finally able to bring up the pressure. Then I sat around and waited. I breathed. The suit regulated the air. All was well. Let's take a look at that first part. carefully to see if it had to replace any lost air. After an hour with no noticeable change, I declared the first test a success. I rolled up the whole thing, wadded up really, and took it out to the rover. You know, I suit up a lot these days. I bet that's another record I hold. A typical Martian astronaut does what? 40 EVAs? I've done several hundred. Once I brought the bed room to the rover, I attached it to the airlock from the inside. Then I hold the release to let it loose. I was still wearing my EVA suit because I'm not an idiot. The bedroom fired out and filled in three seconds. The open airlock hatchway led directly to it, and it appeared to be holding pressure. Just like before, I let it sit for an hour. And just like before, it worked great. Unlike the Hab Kansas resealing, I got this one right on the first try. Mostly because I didn't have to do it with a damn EVA suit on. Originally, I planned to let my bedroom sit overnight and check on it in the morning. But I ran into a problem. I can't get out if I do that. The rover has only one airlock, and the bedroom was attached to it. There was no way for me to get out without detaching the bedroom. And no way to attach and pressurize the bedroom without being inside the rover. It's a little scary. The first time I test the thing overnight will be with me in it. But that'll be later. I've got enough today. Log entry. Soul 390. I have to face facts. I'm done prepping the rover. I don't feel like I'm done, but it's ready to go. Food. 1,692 potatoes. Vitamin pills. Water. 620 liters. Shelter. Rover, trailer, bedroom. Air. Rover and trailer combined storage. 14 liters liquid O2. 14 liters liquid N2. Life support. Oxygenator and atmospheric regulator. 418 hours of use okay, so. star CO2 filters for emergencies. Power. 36 kilowatt hours of storage. Carrying capacity right. for 29 solar cells. Heat. 1400 watt RTG. Homemade reservoir to heat regulators return air. Electric heater and rover as a backup. Disco. Lifetime supply. I'm leaving here on Sol 449. That gives me 59 souls to test everything and fix whatever isn't working right. Then decide what's coming with me and what's staying behind. Plot a route to ski Apparelli using a grainy satellite map and rack my brains trying to think of anything important I forgot. Since Soul 6, all I wanted to do was get the hell out of here. Now the prospect of leaving the hat behind scares the shit out of me. I need some encouragement. I need to ask myself, what would an Apollo astronaut do? He drink three whiskey sours, drive his Corvette to the launch pad, and fly to the moon a command module smaller than my rover. Man, those guys were cool. Chapter 21. Log entry. Soul 431. I'm working out how to pack. It's harder than it sounds. I have two pressure vessels, the rover and the trailer. They're connected by hoses, but they're also not stupid. If one loses pressure, the other will instantly seal off the shared lines. There's a grim logic to this. If the rover breaches, I'm dead. No point in planning around that. But if the trailer breaches, I'll be fine. That means I should put everything important in the rover. Everything that goes in the trailer has to be comfortable in near vacuum and freezing temperatures. Not that I anticipate that, but you know, plan for the worst. The saddlebags I made for the Pathfinder trip okay. will come in handy for food storage. I can't just store potatoes in the rover or trailer. They'd rot in the warm, pressurized environment. I'll keep some in the rover right. for easy access, but the rest will be outside in the giant freezer that is this planet. The trailer will be packed pretty tight. It'll have two bulky half batteries, the atmospheric regulator, the oxygenator, and my homemade heat reservoir. It would be more convenient to have the reservoir in the rover, but it has to be near the regulator's return air feed. The rover will be pretty packed, too. When I'm driving, I'll keep the bedroom folded up near the airlock, ready for emergency egress. Also, I'll have the two functional EVA suits in there with me, and anything that might be 
CO2 it pulls from the air. When starting the trailer to make room, I left one tank in place for this. It's supposed to hold oxygen, but a tank's a tank. Thank God all the airlines and valves are standardized across the mission. That's no mistake. It was a deliberate decision to make field repairs easier. Once I had the ARBC in place, I hooked the oxygenator and regulator into the trailer's power and watched them power up. I ran both through full diagnostics to confirm they were working correctly. Then I shut down the oxygenator. Remember, I'll only use it one soul out of every five. I moved to the rover, and I had to do an annoying 10-meter EVA. From there, I monitored the life support situation. It's worth noting that I can't monitor the actual support equipment from the rover. It's all in the trailer. The rover can tell me all about the air. Oxygen, CO2, temperature, humidity, etc. Everything seemed okay. After getting back into the EVA suit, I released a canister of CO2 into the rover's air. I watched the rover computer have a shit fit when it saw the CO2 spike to lethal levels. Then, over time, the levels dropped to normal. The regulator was doing its job. Good boy. I left the equipment running when I returned to the hat. It'll be on its own all night, and I'll check it in the morning. It's not a true test, because I'm not there to breathe up the oxygen and make CO2. But one step at a time. Walk it. Soul 435. Last night was weird. I knew logically that nothing bad would happen in just one night. But it was a little unnerving to know I had no life support other than heaters. My life depended on some math I've done earlier. If I dropped a sign or added two numbers wrong, I might never wake up. But I did wake up. The main computer showed the slight rise in CO2 I had predicted. Looks like I'll live another song. Live another song would be an awesome name for a James Bond movie. I checked up on the rover. Everything was fine. If I don't drive it, a single charge of the batteries could keep the regulator going for over a month with the heater off. It's a pretty good saving margin to have. If all hell breaks loose on my trip, I'll have time to fix things. I'll be limited by oxygen consumption rather than CO2 removal. I have plenty of oxygen. I decided it was a good time to test the bedroom. I got in the rover and attached the bedroom to the outer airlock door from the inside. Like I mentioned before, this is the only way to do it. Then I turned it loose on an unsuspecting Mars. As intended, the pressure from the rover blasted the canvas outward and inflated it. After that, chaos. The sudden pressure popped the bedroom like a balloon. It quickly deflated, leaving both itself and the rover devoid of air. I was wearing my EVA suit at the time. I'm not a fucking idiot. So I get to live another soul. Starring Mark Watney as probably Q. I know James Bond. I dragged the pop bedroom into the hab and gave it a good going over. It failed at the scene where the wall met the ceiling. Makes sense. It's a right angle in a pressure vessel. Physics hates that sort of thing. First, I patched it up, then I cut strips of spare canvas to place over the seam. Now it has double thickness and double sealing resin all around. Maybe that'll be enough. At this point, I'm kind of guessing. My amazing botany skills aren't much use for this. I'll test it again tomorrow. Log entry. Soul 436. Okay, the whole line. Again. For some reason, a high concentration of O2 will kill most headaches. Don't know why. Don't care. The important thing is I don't have to suffer. I tested out the bedroom again. I suited up What's the bedroom and released the bedroom, same as last time. But this time it held. That's great. But having seen the fragile nature of my handiwork, I wanted a good long test of the pressure seal. After a few minutes standing around in my EVA suit, I decided to make better use of my time. I may not be able to leave the rover slash bedroom universe while the bedroom is attached to the airlock, but I can stay in the rover and close the door. Once I did that, I took off the uncomfortable EVA suit. The bedroom was on the other
other side of the airlock door, still fully pressurized. So I'm still running my test, but I don't have to wear the EVA suit. I arbitrarily picked eight hours for the test duration, so I was trapped in the rover until then. I spent my time planning the trip. There wasn't much to add to what I already knew. I'll beeline out of Acidalia Planitia to Mora Phallus, then follow the valley until it ends. It'll take me on a zigzag route, which will dump me into Arabia Terra. After that, things get rough. Unlike Acidalia Planitia, Arabia Terra is riddled with craters, and each crater represents two brutal elevation changes. First down, then up. I did my best to find the shortest path around them. I'm sure I'll have to adjust the course when I'm actually driving it. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. Mitch took his seat in the conference room. The usual gang was present. Teddy, Venkin, Mitch, and Annie. But this time there was also Mindy Park, as well as a man Mitch had never seen before. What's up, Frank? Mitch asked. Why the sudden meeting? We've got some developments, Venkin said. Mindy, why don't you bring them up to date? Ah, uh, yeah, Mindy said. Looks like Watney finished the balloon addition to the trailer. It mostly uses the design we sent him. Any idea how stable it is? Teddy asked. Pretty stable, she said. It's been inflated for several days with no problems. All right, everyone. That's the time we have for today. I hope you enjoy it. And again, if you have any questions, comments, or requests, please let me know in the comment areas. And as always, like and subscribe. Stay safe and wash your hands.